Dusty Strummer had perhaps his best game in a Gonzaga uniform as the team secured a revenge victory over Santa Clara on Saturday. Will this momentum carry the Zags into two big, big wins this week? You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Happy Monday and welcome into the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by FanDuel. Folks, make every moment more. Right now, new customers who join today, you'll get $150 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. So visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today. To get started, well, the Zags secured a 13-point victory over the Broncos of Santa Clara on Saturday. We're going to talk about that game and then go through some mailbag questions here on Mailbag Monday. If you want to get involved in Mailbag Monday, you can reach out to me via email, andypatton 13 at gmail.com. You can also join our Discord channel. It is free to join. There is a link in the show notes on both audio and video platforms. You can click that link, come hang out with us 24-7. I want to start with just some notes on the game. Zags won 94-81, final score there. Zags' offense was absolutely humming along in this one, 57% from the field, 8 of 16 or 50% from three. You'll recall last time Gonzaga and Santa Clara met, Gonzaga shot 2 of 20 from three. So to see that improve this dramatically, from 10 percentage points to 50 percent uh, is a huge, huge thing for Gonzaga going forward. Uh, Graham E.K. was masterful in this game, as he has been throughout the majority of the season. 26.7 boards on 9 of 13 shooting. But the star in my mind in this game was Dusty Stromer. Dusty came off the bench. He played 27 minutes in this one. He had 10 points, 4 rebounds, and a steal. He was 4 of 5 from the field. Two of two from three. He made two really clutch, really critical three-pointers at great times. They were great shot selection. His decision-making improved. He knocked these shots down. Four rebounds were hard-fought rebounds, tenacious rebounds. He's a really good offensive rebounder. He's fantastic uh, at at fighting for defensive rebounds as well. Just a really all-around great, confident game from Dusty Stromer. He looked good on all facets and is starting to really look like the player that we saw from him in spurts at the beginning of the season. But now we're starting to see, hopefully with a little bit more consistency, because he is vital to this team's success going forward this season. Going to handle, going to take a couple of mailbag questions here uh, before we get into the rest of the show. This one comes from Austin via Discord. Austin says, another win in the bag, but this one felt a little dicey at times. What was it about Santa Clara that was getting to Gonzaga? Is it the size, the defense, the hot first half shooting, something else? It's the size. Look, Gonzaga identified that Santa Clara was going to be a tough matchup for him before the season started. Like before we got into conference play, the Zags staff knew, hey, Santa Clara is a tough matchup for us. They, they, they knew that, that that road game against Santa Clara early in the season, when Gonzaga was still struggling, figuring things out, they knew that one might be a tricky one. And obviously, that ended up being the case. Santa Clara is the fifth tallest team in college basketball, according to Ken Palm's metrics. They're huge. And in this game, you could see it. Plays that Ryan Nembhard normally makes get knocked away by defenders. Shots that normally go in get altered in a way where they miss at the front of the rim. Santa Clara was preventing Gonzaga from getting offensive rebounds for huge chunks of the game early on. They also had a strategy of really trying to get Watson and EK and Greg in foul trouble. It was a clearly evident strategy on their end that Gonzaga was fortunately able to avoid for the most part, but they had a good strategy. They're a well-coached team. They're a talented team, and they are a big, long team. And all of that adds up to problems for Gonzaga. But unlike last time, Gonzaga weathered the storm and managed to pull off a really, really quality victory here. Next question comes from Christian via Gmail. Christian says, Anton Watson's last home game brings up a lot of emotions and memories. Do you have a couple favorite Anton anecdotes? Yeah, I love this for Anton. Uh, His second senior year, his final game in the McCarthy Athletic Center for a Spokane kid, a kid who, who grew up rooting for Gonzaga, who grew up in the area. 
I don't know about specific anecdotes. I loved his performance against Kentucky last year when he bottled up Oscar Shibway in the mid post and really helped Gonzaga secure that win at the arena. That was one of my favorite performances from him. The UCLA game this year where he went absolutely nuclear. I think he was like 14 of 15 from the field, had 35, I think, of Gonzaga's points in that game against UCLA. Those two performances really stand out, but for Anton, it's really the story. The timing with with kind of my career coming into covering Gonzaga always lines up well. One of the first podcast episodes I ever did was about Anton Watson four games into his freshman year. So I think about that a lot when I think about Anton of like kind of the timing lining up of when I kind of got really into this industry versus when Anton started at Gonzaga. So that's kind of what I think about. But what a tremendous player, uh, talent, kid, uh, just local guy to have come through this program and do what he's been able to do has been one of the the true joys of my professional career covering Gonzaga and just as a fan as well. Next question comes from Jeff via Gmail. Jeff says, Gonzaga finished the regular season with a 2-0 week. They will guarantee them spots, themselves a spot in the NCAA tournament. True? False? Most likely? Probably? But they still need to get to the WCC finals or depends? So it's kind of a combo of those last couple of things. I think the answer is not true or false. The answer is most likely. I think if Gonzaga wins these two games, they are very likely in the NCAA tournament field of 68, even if they don't win the WCC championship. But I do think that they probably need to get to the WCC finals. If somebody who's not very good upsets San Francisco, like San Diego or Pepperdine or whatever, and then upsets Gonzaga and they take a quad three loss, that could that could be a problem for them, even if they've already won those games against San Francisco and St. And Mary's. So I think the answer is most likely, but they do still need to get to the WCC championship game. I think that that really helps. I think that that pretty much puts it in the absolute bag at that point. So I guess I would say D. Yes, they're going to get in if they win those two games, but they also need to at least make it to the WCC championship game. Final question of the first segment here comes from Austin. Via Discord, Austin says, been hearing a lot about peaking at the right time because March is just around the corner. Do you think Gonzaga is indeed peaking at the right time, or is that just a premature idea given the two opponents that await this week? Yeah, Christian via Gmail, Jeff via Gmail also asked about this team peaking at the right time, so kind of lumped those all together here. I don't know if Gonzaga is peaking as much as they have just kind of found the, the comfortability, the familiarity with each other. Like, this was such a brand new team with – very few returnees. The guys who were returning were in different roles, like Nolan Hickman playing off the ball and Anton Watson having to be a more offensive kind of figurehead for this team. And Ben Gregg's role has changed throughout the season. So I think that coupled with a freshman starting at the last minute, uh, Braden Huff's increased role and figuring out how to acclimate the, the transfers in Graham E.K. and Ryan Nempar, I think it just took time. I think it just took time. And now that we're there, I don't know if that means we've peaked because peaking would imply that we're about to go down. And I don't think that the, the Zags have peaked. I think that they may struggle against San Francisco or St. Mary's. They may split these two games. That could happen. But I don't think that would mean that they peaked already. These are just really good teams that they're about to play. And Gonzaga's peak this year is not the same as Gonzaga's peak in 2021 or 2017 or really or 2019 when their peak is – nobody in college basketball can beat them. That is not Gonzaga's peak this year. It's just not. They're just not that good of a team, even when they're fully healthy, with this year fully healthy minus Steel Venters. When they're at that level, they're really, really good. And, and the best version of Gonzaga absolutely beats San Francisco, absolutely beats St. Mary's, absolutely goes to the Sweet 16. Like all of that stuff is true. But I'm not sure if Gonzaga is there or if they have just steadily improved throughout the year and are continuing to do so. I do think that these two games are a huge test. And that winning by eight or something or barely winning both those games doesn't mean that Gonzaga was better last week or the week before that. It just means that they're still continuing to grind and they're finding out where they need to be. And I think this week is going to tell us a whole heck of a lot about this Gonzaga roster. And if the improvements we have seen from the outside shooting to the overall offensive efficiency to the rebounding with Ben Gregg in the starting lineup to the defense, if those things will stick and will be huge storylines in these two games. Because if they win these two games with that kind of stuff, I think we know that whether they've peaked or not, we know that they are still continuing to move in the right direction heading into March, which is all you can really ask for, especially for a team like this. Well, do the Zags have a go-to guy? And speaking of San Francisco and St. Mary's, let's get ready for those games. How are they looking heading into this big week? More on all of that. 
after a word from today's sponsor, FanDuel. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. So you can bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. DeMontis Sabonis and the Sacramento Kings, seven and a half point favorites at home on Monday night against Miami. I like their odds quite a bit. Miami's struggling a bit. I think Domas and the Kings are going to hand that one to them. If you want to join me, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NBA. All right, folks, segment two, still any patents, still Locked On Zags podcast, and we are still getting through Mailbag Monday here, coming off of Gonzaga's nice win over Santa Clara on Saturday. This question comes from Austin via Discord. Austin says, the starting lineup appears to have hit its stride. Do you think the Zags have that guy now? And if so, who is it? I don't think this is a team that has a guy. Like, <laughs> I just, I don't. I don't think that that's how this team is really constructed. There's not a Drew Timmy on this team that you can rely on to just go get a bucket whenever you need it. There's not a Jalen Suggs. He was that guy in 2017. They just don't really, they're not built that way. And I think that's been part of Gonzaga's problem at times this year, early in the season, in close games, in those losses when things were slipping away against Washington or when they fought back against San Diego State and then had to try to fight back again or when Santa Clara got back into the game, like they didn't really have a guy. Now, Anton Watson was that guy in particular against Santa Clara. He went absolutely insane in that game, but they don't have a, a consistent go-to, let's just get this guy the ball and get him a bucket. Graham E.K. is their most consistent offensive player. He is the player that Gonzaga is most likely to try to get the basketball to in any given situation. But I don't know that he's that guy necessarily. Watson's their best player overall, offensively, defensively, leadership-wise, etc. And he is a guy that they go to consistently when they do need a bucket, but he's not really, that's not his game is not just like go get him the basketball and get out of his way and let him go to work. He can do that, but that's, he's not built that way. Nolan Hickman is almost more the guy than anybody else. He's really clutch. He hits big threes when they need him to. It feels like whenever Gonzaga needs a crowd silencer or something to swing the momentum back in their direction, Nolan Hickman's the guy hitting that shot. He had some incredibly just beautiful shots against Santa Clara on Saturday, some j absolutely jaw-dropping plays. But I don't know that he's – I don't think that they have a guy. I think that they have multiple people they can go to. And I don't necessarily think that's a problem. I'm sure Mark Few and the staff wouldn't tell you that's a problem. But I do wonder what happens when they are in an NCAA tournament game. They're down eight at halftime, and they need just somebody to go get them some baskets to open up the second half. Who, who are they going to go to? It's something I'm curious about. Next question comes from AK Zag on Discord, who says, with the Zags and Dons playing off campus, it would appear this is a plus for Gonzaga. What are the pros for the Dons? In short, what were they thinking? Yeah, this has been talked about a whole bunch of times on the Locked On Zags podcast. In fact, I talked about it quite directly with Coach Chris Gerlofson himself uh, prior to Gonzaga's last game against San Francisco. Uh, and he gave a diplomatic coach's answer, which is what I would have expected him to do. Uh, and if you read between the lines on what he said, his quote was basically, hey, you know, we, we think we have a great home court advantage at War Memorial. And, uh, you know, I was a little skeptical about doing this, but talk to leadership, talk to everybody there. And they, you know, really excited about this opportunity to, to get us at the Chase Center, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, he's not happy about it. And I don't want to put words directly into his mouth, but the expectation, my guess, is that this was pushed by administration for the same reason that anything happens everywhere. Money. They're going to make more money. They're going to make more money off Gonzaga fans, which is part of it. They can only sell so many seats to, to uh, Gonzaga fans at War Memorial, but they can sell a whole heck of a lot more of them at the Chase Center, which means that the University of San Francisco makes way more money. I think it's cool for the kids to get an opportunity to play at the Chase Center. I, uh, they, now, San Francisco already did. They played Minnesota there in the non-conference and won that game. Uh, so it's not as big of a jump for them. For Gonzaga, it's certainly cool for their kids to get that opportunity as well. But this is happening for financial reasons. Chris Gerlison, I don't think, wanted this. I don't think anybody on the staff at San Francisco wanted this game to be played there where they don't have as much of a home court advantage. It was a decision made by the administration because it nets the school more income. Next question comes from Larry via Gmail. Larry says, now that the Gales have regular season titles sewed up, will they play the game on Saturday saying, hey, we've clinched the regular season title, we'll rest the starters and get ready for the tournament, or B, go out, let's sweep the Zags and finish unbeaten? There is a 0.00000% chance 
that Randy Bennett's going to do anything other than try his absolute hardest to win this game on Saturday against the, the Gales. There is zero reason for this team to do anything other than play their absolute best game possible. For starters, St. Mary's doesn't have an NCAA tournament spot locked up. They don't. If they lose this game to San Francisco or to Gonzaga and they lose in the first round of the WCC tournament, they may not make the big dance. It is, I think they probably still will, but it is not guaranteed. They have enough bad losses early in the season, the, enough big struggle, struggles in the non-conference that Weber State loss looms really large that this team is not guaranteed a spot in the NCAA tournament unless they win the WCC regular season, or excuse me, uh, WCC championship. Now, if they beat Gonzaga on Saturday, then I don't think it matters what happens. They could beat Gonzaga on Saturday and get stunned by like a, a red hot San Diego team somehow beats Santa Clara or San Francisco, plays uh, St. Mary's in the semifinal and beats them. That could happen, and St. Mary's would still make the tournament if they beat Gonzaga on Saturday. I think the same is true of Gonzaga. Gonzaga beats San Francisco on Thursday. They beat St. Mary's on Saturday. Whatever happens in the WCC tournament will not prevent them from making the field. I believe that is true, meaning that Gonzaga's game on Saturday against St. Mary's, whoever wins is probably locking up a spot in the NCAA tournament. There is a 0% chance St. Mary's doesn't take that incredibly seriously and do everything they can to win on their home floor in front of their home. Could you imagine them not trying to win in Moraga with their student section there against Gonzaga? That would be malpractice. It's just not going to happen. Next question comes from Jeff via Gmail. Jeff says, Joshua Jefferson did not play at all this week for St. Mary's. Any word on his status for the next couple of weeks? Yeah, he's done. Joshua Jefferson, St. Mary's starting power forward sophomore, uh, had a really good game against Gonzaga last time, helped bottle up Anton Watson in a big way. He's done. Bennett confirmed after the game against San Francisco last week, uh, so this has been known for close to a week now, that, that Joshua Jefferson's not coming back for the rest of the season. Suffered an injury against Portland on February 10th. Uh, he's averaging about 10 points, six and a half boards per game. This is a really tough loss for St. Mary's. This is a tough player to not have in the mix for them on that game on Saturday. Like I said, he's their starting power forward. He's really good defensive player. I projected him as the potential defensive player of the year over Anton Watson, over Jonathan Mobo uh, in the WCC. Uh, now without him in the mix, that they're going to have to fight without him. They'll slide Mason Forbes into that starting spot, a Harvard transfer. He's been okay this year. He's not as good as Joshua Jefferson. It hurts their depth in a big way. They'll need more from Luke Barrett, potentially more from Henry, Henry Wessels as well. But this is a tough loss for St. Mary's and, and gives Gonzaga a, a decent advantage going into that game on Saturday, Moraga. Final question of the second segment here comes from AD Simone 206 on Discord, who says, anything particular you noticed while seeing the Zags in person that maybe you hadn't caught before on TV? Yeah, so I got to see Gonzaga in person on Thursday when they played the Pilots uh, at the Child Center. It was my third time seeing them this season in person, typically see them about four to five times per year, depending on the schedule, depending on my schedule. So it's not like it's completely new to me to see them in person. I see them, or yeah, I see them in person fairly regularly. And I don't think anything really stands out. I think the main things is like without the the announcer narrative, without like it, the games just feel a lot different. Momentum swings feel a lot different in, in the actual arena than they do when you're watching on TV. So I think that's kind of the biggest difference that I've noticed. But other than that, it feels kind of similar to what, what you're watching on TV. Conference realignment, we're going to talk about that. We got some recruiting conversation about the women's team. We also got a little bit more on the women's team and a update, a fun update in particular on the baseball squad. All that coming up right after this. All right, segment three, still Andy Patton, still Locked On Zags podcast, and we are closing out Mailbag Monday here with a question from Bogmeyer34 on Discord who says, Commissioner Stu Jackson played at Seattle U, and I know you are an alumni of Seattle U. Seems like Seattle U and GCU, Grand Canyon, have been the two names thrown around the most during realignment for the WCC. Would you personally like to see Seattle U and Grand Canyon enter the WCC? Which of those two would be better? And would a move like that push Gonzaga further away from the WCC? So I'll address the last part first. Gonzaga doesn't want Seattle U in the WCC. I suspect Portland also does not want Seattle U in the WCC, uh, but I know that Gonzaga does not. They don't want their games in Seattle to be determined by playing a road game in conference against a 
okay, but not great Seattle U team. They like the ability to go play Washington in Seattle, to go play, uh, you know, a game like UConn in Seattle. And while they wouldn't be prevented from doing that, it would likely limit their opportunities if they also knew that they had a road game in conference play in Seattle. So Gonzaga doesn't want to do that. Portland doesn't want to do that because if they're playing a road game in Seattle that's relatively cheap to get tickets to, Gonzaga fans who normally go to one or two road games a year are not going to go to the Portland game. They're going to go to the Seattle game, and that's going to cost the Portland Pilots a whole bunch of money in ticketing revenue. They're already getting squeezed aggressively by Oregon State coming into the conference. That's going to be a problem for Portland. They don't want Seattle U either. But the WCC has to make decisions not based on what Gonzaga wants. For a long time, they made decisions based on what Gonzaga wants because they were placating them, because they felt the threat of Gonzaga potentially leaving was very real when the Mountain West said, yes, we will take you. Since then, the WCC has done whatever they need to give Gonzaga whatever they want. They're no longer doing that. We know that because they invited Oregon State and Washington State, likely not something Gonzaga necessarily, I don't think Gonzaga hates it, but they didn't want it. It also is going to change the uh, the structure of the regular season, less non-conference games for Gonzaga, which they don't want. It is already going to change the way that revenue is split up for NCAA tournament units. That is not something Gonzaga wants either. So the conference is already making decisions that are not direct. They're not checking with Mark Few before they make decisions, which is pretty much quite literally what they were doing before. So the conference has to operate outside the, outside of that because Gonzaga is looking at other places. They're looking at the, uh, the big 12, the big East. We've made some connections there. We believe that there's some, some serious interest on both sides, but Gonzaga is looking to get out of the WCC. So the WCC has to protect their brand. I think in Grand Canyon and Seattle, you would be great additions to the West coast conference. Grand Canyon is a better basketball addition. There's absolutely unquestionably no debate about that. Shout out Seattle U for winning a regular season game against Grand Canyon, mind you, but Grand Canyon is the better basketball addition. The the uh, school, the university does not line up with the WCC at all. That's a big hinge. Uh, the, the people who vote on realignment are not the basketball coaches. It is the school presidents. That is who votes on realignment. University presidents, they have to be convinced to add a school that is a for-profit, non-religious institution like Grand Canyon. That might be a tricky sell. Seattle U, not a tricky sell. Jesuit Catholic institution located on the West Coast, perfect fit for the WCC. But they are a lower resource school. They have less money. They have less staff, faculties, facilities. All of that stuff are lower at Seattle U than everywhere else in the WCC. Seattle U's resources are below San Diego, below Portland, below the other schools in the conference. So that's the selling point that Seattle U needs to be able to make. I think both are great additions. I don't think they both happen until Gonzaga goes somewhere else, if that happens. Next question here comes from Christian via Gmail. Christian says, I was listening to Gary Parrish talk about the two things sports fans want from their teams, winning and hope. We've been very fortunate over the years we've been rocking with the Zags. They continue to give us hope. What are some of the contributing factors for building hope? I thought about your great recruiting episode, which gives fans hope for the future. Gonzaga's the biggest way that they generate hope in the fan base is that they just keep winning basketball games. Every year they win. They win and they win and they win. They make the NCAA tournament. They make the Sweet 16. They continue to win basketball games. They put themselves in a position to be a Sweet 16 Elite Eight Final Four contender most of the time. It's unreal to be saying that as somebody who graduated in 2013 when that was not what they were doing. They are now doing that. Establishing an incredible culture of winning and an incredible culture of hope to the point where when they do slightly worse than usual, as in they're not absolutely solidified, guaranteed a spot in the NCAA tournament by January, there is a lot of panic because that hope starts to feel like it's slipping away for Gonzaga fans. This program does a phenomenal job of that because they are on the cutting edge of roster construction. They are on the cutting edge of player development. They have found ways to build elite programs with player development systems, with utilizing transfers before it was a popular thing to do, utilizing international recruiting before it was a popular thing to do. Now when those things have become more popular, Gonzaga is finding other ways to build resources, to find money, to, to be able to give out to student athletes. They are continuing to be on that cutting edge. And as long as they are there, as long as they do not get complacent, they will still continue to win basketball games and they will still continue to enact hope in their fan base. Next question comes from Patrick via Gmail. Patrick says, we've been up to date on the men's recruiting for 24 and 25. What do we know about the Lady Zags 2024 recruiting class? Three players are set to join Gonzaga in the 2024-25 class. 
Uh, this is from an article written on Gonzaga's website. You can find it there. Uh, the three players are five foot eleven Spanish guard Cristobal Osorobo, five foot eight guard Ali Turner from St. Louis, and six foot three forward Lauren Whitaker from New Zealand. Uh, Coach Fortier spoke about all three of them. I'll just paraphrase what she said. Speaking about Osorobo, she said she's a great athlete. She's a valuable defensive player. She can play multiple positions. She can play the one, the two, a little bit of the three as well. Allie Turner, who's 5'8", she is a great shooter. Fortier described her as an elite shooter, 16 points per game at John Burroughs High School in St. Louis. She can also run the offense, be the facilitator if they need her to be, and she has a steady demeanor. And then Lauren Whitaker, she's the, the big prize of this recruiting class, six foot three forward from New Zealand, MVP of the U19 Nationals, got invited to participate in Basketball Without Borders, only 38 uh, high school women's basketball players were invited to do so. Uh, she has size, she has skill, she has high level international competition experience. She moves incredibly well for her size. Coach Fortier said she's going to be an impact player for this program immediately. The fact that Yvonne is coming back next year means that Whitaker won't have to be a huge big time starter right away. You may recall Yvonne Ejim was WCC sixth woman of the year before becoming now the almost certain WCC player of the year. Yvonne was the sixth woman behind Melody Kempton, who had been the sixth woman before becoming WCC player of the year. So the, the trend is continuing in Spokane and Lauren Whitaker could be the next absolutely great superstar for Coach 48's program. Next question comes from Wade on Discord. Wade says, what Zag duos would make the best buddy cop movie? And why is the answer Shemit Karnowski and Rem Bakamas? Yeah, it's got to be Shem and Rem. Uh, those two guys look like they were built for a buddy cop movie. That's just the, stylistically the, the, the names, the way that they rhyme, the size difference, the fact that they are connected still, both working at Arizona right now under coach Tommy Lloyd. I always thought uh, if you were to do like movie type things with Gonzaga players, you could do a fun fish out of water type buddy cop movie with Jonathan Williams and Jeremy Jones, who both went and played for the same team in Japan for the last couple of years overseas. I always thought there could be something funny to do with that. The Zags have had some other fantastic duos. Kevin Pangos and Gary Bell comes to mind, four-year starters next to each other for a really long time, obviously incredibly talented. You had Stephen Gray and Matt Bolden who were kind of connected together for for many years in Gonzaga's backcourt as well, uh, but nothing top Shem and Rem, and it probably never will. Final question of the show comes from Jeff via Gmail. Jeff says, Gonzaga baseball suffered a gut punch loss Saturday night with Vanderbilt getting a two-out walk-off win in the bottom of the ninth. Even while missing out on a couple major wins, could the silver lining be that Gonzaga is going to be better than many people thought this year? So a couple of things. First of all, this question was submitted before Gonzaga got a win on Sunday against Vanderbilt. They had an eight run seventh inning, eight runs scored in the seventh inning because of back-to-back -back errors by Vanderbilt. And then a grand slam was hit after that. Um, which kind of actually goes into my point. I don't think that early season baseball results are going to are gonna indicate much. Baseball is not like basketball. A bad team upsetting a good team early in the season in basketball is still a big deal. You know, Tom Izzo and Michigan State are going to say, oh, like, you know, losing to James Madison wasn't that huge of a deal, blah, blah, blah. But here's what happened. Michigan State has not recovered fully from that and is still questionable if they're going to make the tournament. James Madison has been one of the best bid majors in the entire league. Because upsets like that don't just happen arbitrarily. But in baseball, every game is close. So it's it can happen. Vanderbilt committing two errors in the same inning and then giving up a grand slam, that's less about Gonzaga, not to discredit them for winning this game, but it's more about Vanderbilt. It's, just, it's early season goofiness. The weather's not th there yet. Baseball takes a while for guys to heat up, warm up. One bad pitching performance can completely derail a game, even if everybody else plays well, even if the talent level is not as, as equal as it may look. So I don't think looking at early season baseball results is going to tell you, oh, Gonzaga is going to be better in the WCC because they beat Vanderbilt on a goofy, airless, disaster seventh inning. I don't think that that tells us that. I guess is the point that I'm trying to make. College baseball is much more of a grind and early season results don't predict nearly the way that they do in basketball or football or, or many other sports. Having said that, Gonzaga getting the opportunity to play UCLA and then play Vanderbilt, the number six team in the country, that's huge. That's huge. And they've been blown out in half the games they've played, but they've played two really close games and they won one. It doesn't hurt. I'm not saying it means a whole lot, but it certainly not doesn't mean anything bad. It just may not mean anything super positive for them going forward. It's, but it's still a win. To win is a win. 
Got a win over the sixth ranked team in the country. Carry that momentum into the next week. I'm excited to see what this baseball team can do as they get more comfortable with each other, as the weather turns around. Uh, I think it's going to be a really fun season uh, at Patterson Baseball Complex for the Zags. It's going to wrap it up for us today here on the Locked On Zags podcast. I want to thank you all so much for making this show your first listen or your first watch of the day. Remind you to join us on our Discord channel. If you have not done so yet, there's a link in the show notes, and it is free to join. We'll be back on Tuesday talking about the AP poll, what happens with Gonzaga on that, all that coming up later this week. Until then, as always, go Zags.